Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our physiology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about the enteric nervous system, slow waves versus spike waves, mastication, salivation, swallowing, gastric motility and secretion, intestinal motility and secretion, colon defecation, talked about the pancreas, the liver, the gallbladder, bile acids, bile salts, etc. Today, let's talk about vomiting, also known as emesis. Please watch the videos in my physiology playlist in order. Mastication followed by swallowing and then motility. Look at this, we're moving downwards. But vomiting is to move upwards in the opposite direction. The former was moving caudally, the latter is moving orally. Or cranially. Please remember that the first stage of swallowing was voluntary, but stage two and three were involuntary, which means once you initiate swallowing and you're past stage one, you cannot go back. You cannot say, oh, I made a mistake, let me stop it right here. You can't. It's not how it works. But you can vomit, which means move the food in the opposite direction. The definition, reflex expulsion of gastric content, Where's the center for that reflex? It's in the chemotactic trigger zone in your medulla oblongata in your brainstem. Recall that the medulla has four important centers. Heart and lungs, get it in, get it out. Heart and lungs, get it in, get it out. We talked about swallowing before. Where was the center? It was in the medulla. How about vomiting? It's also in the medulla. Clinically speaking, there are two types of vomiting. Non-bilious, which means there is no bile in the vomitus, or bilious vomiting, which has bile in it. If my vomiting is free of bile, it's probably coming from the stomach, esophagus, or anything above it. But if my vomiting is contaminated with bile, it means that the common bile duct has entered the chat, I mean, has entered the posteromedial aspect of the second part of the duodenum. So the duodenum is full of bile, and therefore the jejunum has bile, the ileum has bile, etc. So if my vomit has bile, it came from the duodenum or anything below it. And this distinction between non-bilious versus bilious vomiting is extremely important so that you can figure out where the disease is. Why do we vomit? Many reasons. Vomiting could be protective. Why? It can get rid of many poisons, many toxins. That's why if I have food poisoning, I'm probably vomiting. What if I have acidosis, which means my blood pH is acidic? I may vomit to get rid of the acid. Because remember, when you vomit, you get rid of the gastric content, including hydrochloric acid, which is an acid. So if I have acidosis, I better get rid of some acid. And that's why it's not uncommon to find that acidotic patients in the hospital vomit. It's a protective mechanism. Moreover, if I have hypoxia and there is less oxygen in the blood, probably less oxygen going to the brain and to the heart, do you think I have time to spend oxygen on the gut? No, who cares? There is no time for this nonsense. So hypoxia will cause you to vomit the food content so that you're not busy digesting and absorbing food, which costs energy and oxygen, and forget the vital organs such as the brain and the heart. Some causes of vomiting include reflex causes and central causes. Reflex causes, mechanical stimulation of the posterior tongue. Suppose that medicosis is stuck in the desert. I found some kind of plant, so I said I'm gonna eat it because I'm starving to death. After I ate it and started deglutition, i.e. swallowing, I realized, wow, this is poisonous. What should I do next? Well, there is no hospital around, I don't have the antitoxin, so I will induce vomiting. I can mechanically stimulate the back of the tongue, the back of the palate, the uvula, etc. Or I can swallow a huge amount of salt to irritate my mucosa and this can induce vomiting. Do not do this at home. Another cause is irritation or obstruction of the intestine. Small bowel obstruction is a very famous condition in surgery textbooks. And if you read, one of the symptoms is vomiting. Big time. Because your food cannot pass, because there is an obstruction here, so it will have to go the other way. Loop, vomiting. More causes. Anything that stimulates the chemotactic trigger zone will cause vomiting. And this includes medications known as emetics, which means medications that cause vomiting, because emesis means vomiting. And they include apomorphine, tartar emetic, emetine, 
syrup of epicac. This was a drug used historically by physicians to induce vomiting and to get rid of the toxins from the patient's body. But later, doctor discovered, you know what? Well, the toxin probably damaged the mucosa going in. It's not the best idea to also damage the mucosa again while going out. Plus, it had more side effects, so it fell out of favor. Motion sickness causes nausea and vomiting. Big time. This is the labyrinth or your inner ear, cranial nerve 8, also known as auditory nerve, also known as vestibulocochlear nerve, also known as statoacoustic nerve. Acidosis and hypoxia, as we've discussed before. Vomiting is a reflex. Remember that the reflex arc is the functional unit of the nervous system. Any reflex has sarasir, which in Arabic means cockroaches. What's the S? Stimulus. R. Receptor. A. Afferent. Which goes from the receptor to the central nervous system. Center is in the central nervous system. The afferent will leave the central nervous system and go to the effector organ to elicit a response. All of this happens very quickly. The vomiting reflex. Stimulus. Irritation of the mucosa in the stomach or intestine. Or mechanical stimulation of the posterior tongue. Or obstruction of the intestine. Receptors are in the mucosa, usually chemoreceptors, but if I'm hitting the back of my tongue, mechanoreceptors. Afferent, from the parasympathetic, it's the vagus nerve. From the sympathetic, we have sympathetic fibers, usually part of the greater splanchnic nerve or the lesser splanchnic nerve. The word splanchnic means visceral. Where is the center? It's the chemotactic trigger zone in the medulla oblongata of the brain stem of your brain. The efferent, lots of nerves, including cranial nerves 5, 7, 9, 10, 12, to the pharynx, palate, larynx, posterior tongue, etc. Phrenic nerve, which comes from C, 3, 4, 5, keep the diaphragm alive, to the diaphragm, spinal nerves to the abdominal muscles. Where's the effector organ? They are in the pharynx, palate, larynx, diaphragm, and abdominal muscles. Let's go. What's the response? Let's vomit together. Before you vomit, you'll feel nauseous. You're sweating like crazy. You're salivating and your heart is beating really fast. That's why we need some sympathetic fibers. Then, deep inspiration powerful contraction of the diaphragm, abdominal muscle contraction. All of this will raise the intra-abdominal pressure because when the diaphragm contracts, it is pushed downwards. When the abdominal muscles contract, they are pushed inwards. This will decrease the volume of your abdominal cavity, which will raise the pressure according to Boyle's law. It states that Quote, the relationship between the volume and the pressure is inverse, provided that the temperature is kept constant. Close quote. Your intra-abdominal pressure will go up, which will squeeze your gut and force the gastric or the intestinal or both content upwards. And then I should protect my nose, elevate the soft palate to close the nasopharynx and the nose. I should protect my larynx, close the glottis to protect your larynx, I, because I do not want food to end up in the trachea or in my nose. These mechanisms do not work 100% of the time. If you recall the last time you vomited, you probably had some food particles in your nose. Next, the vomiting center is in the medulla. You know what else is in the medulla? Respiratory center. Remember, heart and lungs. Get it in, get it out. So you will have a momentary apnea. Just for a few seconds, not even a second. So you will stop breathing for a second until you vomit and then you'll continue breathing once more. Because we're focused on vomiting and because we want to protect the larynx and the trachea and the lungs. Otherwise, you might suffer from aspiration and chemical pneumonitis. No one wants that. How did the vomitus end up upwards like this? Well, you need to contract the pyloric sphincter because we're going upwards. We do not want to go downward. And you need to relax the lower esophageal sphincter. Everything here needs to be relaxed. By the way, one of the common mistakes that students make is that they assume that your stomach is contracted during vomiting. No, the stomach is passive and relaxed during vomiting. What squeezes it is your diaphragm and abdominal muscles. More causes of vomiting are listed here. This is not a comprehensive list. To the clinic. 
Antihistamines. Well, what are you talking about? Mostly when we say antihistamines, we mean anti-H1 histamine receptors. These medications might be used as anti-emetics during pregnancy. They are also anti-motion sickness, anti-insomnia, anti-congestants, and anti-allergy. However, anti-H2 are antacids. They are used to treat peptic ulcer disease. Moreover, recall that antihistamines are also anticholinergics. They block the muscarinic receptors. Remember that the vagus was involved in vomiting. Oh, that makes sense. Here is another clinical tip. Common side effects of chemotherapy include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, bone marrow suppression, hair loss. You know the rest of the story. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. How can I give the patient chemotherapy and protect the patient from nausea and vomiting, you can give an anti-emetic with the chemotherapy. Options include undancitrone, which is a serotonin receptor antagonist. What kind of serotonin receptor? Serotonin 3, 5-HT3 receptor. Or you can try apripitant, which works on NK1 receptor. Hey, medicosis, does this stand for natural killer cells? Oh, shut up. It stands for neuro kinin kinetic in my brain ah oh, vomiting yep vomiting causes what metabolic alkalosis i mean think about it when you vomit you're losing the acid from the stomach when i lose the acid i am becoming more basic hashtag alkalosis is this your lungs fault no it's not my lungs fault okay dokie so we'll call it metabolic alkalosis when you vomit you're losing the h that's why you develop metabolic alkalosis you're losing the chloride, and that's why you develop hypochloremia. When you vomit, you lose volume, so you develop volume depletion. Anytime you develop volume depletion, someone will get triggered, no pun intended. And this is aldosterone. Aldosterone will reabsorb sodium and chloride, trying to attract more water to replenish your volume in the kidney. But aldosterone will also ditch your potassium in the urine, causing hypokalemia. So in a nutshell, vomiting can cause hypochloremic, hypokalemic, metabolic alkalosis with extracellular fluid volume depletion. Never ever forget this. Moreover, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which we talked about before, can also lead to hypochloremic, hypokalemic, metabolic alkalosis. Why? Because it's a gastronoma. Gastrin means more acid. More acid. Oh, I'm losing the acid. Yes, indeed. You will get the same thing as if you vomited. Add to that the fact that patients with Zollinger-Ellison syndrome may be vomiting because acid irritates the mucosa, especially when it's too much. Why is acidosis associated with hyperkalemia? Many reasons. If I have acidosis, it means that I have more protons in my blood. One way to mitigate this acidity is to buffer the hydrogen against potassium. So the cell will take the hydrogen from you, trying to lower the level of hydrogen ions in the blood. But since you gave the cell positive, the cell will have to give you a positive in exchange to preserve electroneutrality. So potassium will end up in the blood, causing hyperkalemia. Reason number two, acidemia or acidosis will inhibit the kidney's ability to ditch the potassium, which means potassium will pile up in your blood, leading to hyperkalemia. Reason number three, do you know why we call potassium K? Because it comes from kalium, which came from an Arabic word, kalawi, alkaline, kalawi. Think about it. If you have too much acid and you want to mitigate and counteract this, wouldn't you want more alkaline potassium in your blood? Oh, but I don't believe you that potassium is alkaline. Well, there is water all over the body, correct? And potassium plus water will take the OH and we'll get KOH, which is a basic compound. If acidosis causes hyperkalemia, then we can say that conversely alkalosis is associated with hypokalemia. Same story, but opposite direction. Moreover, don't forget that aldosterone reabsorbs salt and water, but excretes potassium and hydrogen. So you have alkalosis with hypokalemia. Remember that potassium is basic. If you have alkalosis, do you want more base? Oh, heck no. Therefore, get rid of the potassium. 
So, we have three causes of alkalosis in vomiting. You lost the H, your kidney will try to reabsorb more base, and aldosterone, triggered by your volume depletion, will dish the acid into the urine, and you'll end up being alkalotic in your blood. Moreover, we also have two causes of hypokalemia in vomiting. Number one, you lost the potassium with the chloride in the vomitus because there is lots of potassium in the gut, if you remember my previous videos. Moreover, when you vomit, you get extra cellular fluid volume depletion. Aldosterone will go up. Aldosterone will ditch potassium into the urine and you'll end up with less potassium in your emia, i.e. blood. By the way, metabolic alkalosis is pure evil. Thankfully, it's the least common acid-based disturbance. If you want to learn more about respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, then download my acid base imbalance course at medicosisperfectionatis.com. We're talking about acid base in 30 videos. I will help you become better than most of your professors put together. And if you want to learn about small bowel obstruction and paralytic ileus and many other conditions, download my surgery high yields course. To learn about aldosterone, titratable acidity, filtration, clearance, antidiuretic hormone, etc., download my renal physiology course. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.